Okay, good afternoon, everyone who's in the Southern Hemisphere, and good morning to Damon, who's in the Northern Hemisphere, I believe. Um, my name is Zebedee Nichols, and I'm going to be your moderator for today. And I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar, International Climate Negotiations, a Delicate State of Play. And we're very lucky to have Dan here today as our presenter. So I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm a PhD student here at the Climate and Energy College. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the unceded land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging of the various lands from which we're joining this webinar, both here in Australia and overseas. I'd also like to thank the Climate and Energy College for hosting this webinar. There's a few quick housekeeping things to cover before we get started. So the first is that this webinar will be recorded um, and the video will be made available on the Climate and Energy College website thereafter, which is a great resource for us all, but it's important to keep in mind when you are speaking that it will likely be there forever. Uh, the way this webinar will work is Damon will present to us for about 45 minutes or so. And during that time, what we'd like you to do is submit questions throughout the presentation by clicking on chat and typing your questions there. And feel free to have discussions amongst yourselves on the chat too. And I'll try, try my best to keep up with everything that's going on. Then once Damon's brought his presentation to a close, we'll move into the question time. And during that time, please click the raise hand button. You should all be able to see it with any luck. Um, so we can identify you easily to invite you to ask your question. And so what I'll do is I'll introduce you or say your name and then I'll give you, turn your mic on so you can then speak. If you could ask your question, that would be great. And then Damon can respond. Um, we're also very fortunate that Damon has offered to stay on, discuss other questions for a bit longer than the actual seminar length for those who are interested. And so the way this will work is we'll get through as many questions as possible within our hour. At the end of the hour, I'll bring formal proceedings to a close and we'll stop the recording. And then um, what we'll do is we'll leave the Zoom meeting running so those who wish to keep discussing can continue to do so with Damon. So with all of that out of the way, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Damon Jones. Damon Jones is a climate environmental lawyer and for the past four years has been the head of climate diplomacy at Climate Analytics. Um, in this role, Damon leads negotiation support and advisory activities for small island developing states, also known as SIDS, and least developed countries, also known as the LDCs. And he's performed this role under the UNFCCC, the Paris Agreement, the Green Climate Fund, and many other international climate fora. Uh, Damon was at the heart of the Paris climate negotiations in 2015, and over the last four years has supported vulnerable countries in the development and negotiation of the implementation guidelines under the Paris rulebook. So without any further ado, I'd like to pass over to Damon, and I hope we have a great seminar today. Thank you very much, uh, Zebedee, and, and good afternoon to everyone over there in Australia, and uh, good morning or other time zones for anyone else joining um, elsewhere. Um, I'm coming to you from, from Cologne in Germany, so it's, um, it's great to have the opportunity to be with, uh, with you and with the college uh, today. Um, I was lucky enough to um, have the chance to be working out of the college for a few weeks in, in February and March um, before a rather rapid exit due to COVID implications um, in terms of travel restrictions. So um, back in Germany now, but it was um, great to see all the fantastic work being done there at the college. So thanks very much for the opportunity um, today. Um, so as Zebedee said, I'm gonna run through um, a presentation and then look forward to some uh, discussion, discussion afterwards. And as Zebedee said, I'm from Climate Analytics. Um, we're a policy and, and uh, scientific institute based in Berlin with offices um, in a few other locations um, around the world. Um, and uh, as you said, I head up the climate diplomacy team um, that supports SIDS and LDCs um, in the negotiations. So the focus of my discussion today, my presentation, um, I'm not, as you can imagine, gonna go through um, every aspect of the negotiations over the last 12 months, that would be rather dry and, um, and detailed. So what I am going to try to do is sort of take a step back and look at a, a few key elements and look at some technical and um, research that's been done in a few areas, um, primarily focused um, on the um, issue of ambition um, and what's happening in the negotiations uh, on the dynamic around, around ambition and looking at some of the um, more detailed aspects of what are coming through in the negotiations that are either supporting um, momentum towards ambition 
others that are um, potentially undermining um, ambition and the, the broader implementation um, of the Paris Agreement. So I'm going to do that in, in, in four parts, as you can see there on the, on the screen. Um, provide a, a brief update on the negotiations themselves. Um, look at the particular priorities of SIDS and, and LDCs, particularly in the ambition context. Then look, given that I'm talking to a predominantly Australian audience, I thought it'd be useful just to bring to, um, uh, bring to the presentation some aspects that came through in Madrid in the context of um, the Australian positioning on particularly things such as carryover um, of Kyoto Protocol units um, under the Article 6 and broader negotiations. Um, and then touch at the end on, on uh, the COVID-19 recovery issues um, and how that um, has the potential to um, impact on uh, the dynamic around the negotiations as well. So, firstly on the, on the negotiations, um, you might be able to spot me there on the right hand side. Um, I'm going to touch on, on a few aspects of, of that and I know most people um, on the call we are very, very familiar with uh, the negotiation process um, and its objectives and its key elements so I'm not going to spend any real time on that but just for, for anyone who um, needs a quick refresher, um, we're talking about the international climate negotiations happening under the UNFCCC um, and now also under the Paris Agreement which was adopted um, as you know in 2015 and came into force in 2016. Um, the fundamentals of the Paris Agreement, um, just to spend a couple of moments on that, um, important in the context of ambition um, in terms of highlighting some key elements. Um, the long-term temperature goal of the Paris Agreement in terms of limiting temperature increase to well below two degrees and pursuing efforts to limit it to 1.5. Um, under Article 4, you've got this um, ambition architecture around trying to ensure that you have global peaking of emissions um, as soon as possible um, and moving towards um, a balance towards net zero of greenhouse gas emissions um, in the second half of the century with the science now telling us that that needs to be um, by 2050. Um, the mitigation architecture under the Paris Agreement um, obviously is, is central to, um, to its implementation in the context of nationally determined contributions, um, which are the five yearly um, plans that each country brings forward um, and the, the Paris Agreement has some very specific um, obligations and specific requirements in relation to um, what countries are expected and obliged to do um, with respect to those nationally determined contributions. Um, they're um, to reflect the highest possible ambition um, of each party bringing forward um, a five-year plan. Um, there's a commitment to undertake domestic measures with the aim of achieving their NDCs. Um, to come back every five years um, showing progression and showing more ambition in the NDCs that come forward each time, um, underpinned by the scientific understanding that keeps developing, um, all with the aim of closing that emissions gap um, in an aggregate sense um, and to check in every five years through a global stock take process um, to see how we're tracking um, collectively in terms of progress towards um, the long-term temperature and other goals um, under the Paris Agreement. Um, in terms of other architecture, um, as people would be familiar, there's a range of other core components of the agreement, adaptation, um, loss and damage, um, finance, obviously critical um, for a developing country um, and vulnerable country perspective um, in terms of the long-term finance goal, um, the enhanced and transparency framework, um, a key component of the agreement in terms of um, being able to collect um, report on information um, in terms of individual countries and then to aggregate that up um, to understand how we're tracking in terms of mitigation action in terms of adaptation um, also in terms of um, the provision of finance and financial support and, and the needs that continue to mount um, in a developing country context so, um, and, and for the purposes of my ambition focus today, it's really important to keep in mind the, the Article 4 architecture, um, as I've outlined, um, represented graphically here, just to sort of highlight the fact that um, what, we, does, what we've designed under the Paris Agreement and all agreed to in terms of um, the countries that have ratified it, um, is this um, early peaking and then 
decline to below net zero um, by mid-century. Um, and so that becomes the reference point um, with which um, all the countries are expected to be acting in terms of bringing forward um, NDCs um, every five years. They did that um, in the lead up to Paris in 2014, 2015. Um, and now, as people will know, there's an expectation um, that countries bring forward new and updated NDCs um, by the end of, of this year, 2020. So a lot, a lot has happened since, since Paris in 2015. Um, and as, it, as I've said there, a lot hasn't happened as well. There's still plenty of work uh, to be done. We've had progress through the, the international UNFCCC negotiation process in terms of the annual conference of the parties that happen um, towards the end of each year. Um, and that's seen significant progress in terms of, in terms of uh, receiving the science that's come on board, um, in terms of developing the rule book, um, in terms of um, other political and technical momentum around um, issues that enable and facilitate the operationalization and, and implementation of the Paris, Paris Agreement. Um, as we now know, um, with the COVID-19 implications, we're not gonna have a COP this year. Um, COP26 has been postponed until next year. Um, and so there's been some, a lot of rescheduling and a lot of uh, reorienting, reorienting activities um, to account for that. Um, the mid-year bond negotiation session, which um, um, annually happens in the May-June period, has also been postponed provisionally to October um, um, with a final decision depending on um, the coronavirus uh, status um, at the start of August to make a final decision whether that's feasible to have an in-person meeting um, in October, um, or whether that also has to be further postponed. Um, so we've got this, this window now that's longer than usual between COPs um, uh, and, and opportunities as well as challenges um, in that context. So let's, let's turn to the, to the ambition focus and, and, the, and the main focus of my presentation um, today uh, in the context of the negotiations. Um, we've had some really important scientific reports that have come through in the last um, 12 to 18 months um, in the context of the work from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, sending a very clear signal. Um, and that signal is that much more ambitious climate action is needed. We need to see a halving of global emissions, CO2 emissions um, by 2030 from 2010 levels um, to reach that net zero um, trajectory. Um, and that, that's really important in the context of the climate diplomacy and the political momentum in the negotiations because there's a, a lot of talk and focus at the moment on net zero by 2050. Um, but that's only achievable if ambition is ramped up in this decade. Um, and the science is very clear on that. We can't set a 2050 target and hope for the best um, down the track. It requires um, strong and concerted action this decade to enable um, that trajectory towards a net zero 2050 pathway to be feasible. Um, so we need to see that um, come through um, and that's being discussed in various contexts in, in the negotiations. Because um, if it's not, um, and coming from, from my position where I'm supporting vulnerable countries in the negotiations, they're, as you can imagine, seeing really increased risks um, and impacts and costs of climate change already, and that's really escalating. Um, and it's gonna really compromise further the ability to achieve sustainable development in those countries, but also every country, um, as we're seeing those impacts um, across the globe, and certainly by no means only in vulnerable countries, um, uh, just that they're more on the front line in terms of the severe impacts that uh, are coming through in terms of extreme weather events, slow onset events uh, and other impacts um, coming through um, physically and, and through their economies um, as we speak. Um, and, that, and that becomes really critical to the long-term temperature goal of the Paris Agreement in terms of being able to achieve that 1.5 degree limit and not to exceed that. We've seen other science come through as well last year in, in, in the form of two further special reports, um, one on land and one on the ocean and the cryosphere, um, reaffirmed those messages um, and very important in the context of 
setting a foundation for um, the ambition related um, and other technical discussions um, in the negotiations. More science to come next year and in, and in 2022 in the context of the sixth assessment reports um, and work very much underway and um, in full flight on those um, as we speak. So, as I said, I'm not going to go through, um, it'd be a very long presentation if I was to go through all the elements of, of, of what's happened in the negotiations last year and, and in the preceding years. Um, but this just gives you a snapshot um, for those less familiar. Um, there's a, a rule book that's been developed that sits under the Paris Agreement, um, which provides the more detailed rules um, that um, give countries the, the direction and guidance needed to implement their various obligations and other opportunities under the Paris Agreement um, in the area of ambition in the con sorry mitigation in the context of NDCs um, adaptation um, rolling out the transparency rules modalities procedures and guidelines um, on the action side and support um, in the context of um, uh, reporting um, rules as well as now work being done on reporting templates and report outlines. Um, the global stock take to make sure that's ready and designed to, to come into um, to play for the first global stock take in 2023 and the lead up work that's required for that. Um, the compliance committee um, that sits um, as an important part of the Paris Agreement um, and other issues such as loss and damage, which has a has its own article, Article 8 in the Paris Agreement, um, and the rules ensuring that that has visibility and um, can be reported on through the transparency framework and, and global stock take. So all that work's been progressed. There was the, the adoption of the um, Paris rulebook um, in most part um, in Katowice in December 2018, um, but some missing, missing elements um, importantly, and a key one is the Article 6 um, rules for markets and non-market approaches, um, which has been a really uh, difficult and at times toxic negotiation in the, in the context of the last couple of, well, for many years, but um, continuing the last couple of years. Um, and for the vulnerable countries, SIDS and LDCs and, and others, um, that's a really important part of the negotiations and, and the rules um, to ensure that it also delivers um, on ambition um, and that it produces robust rules that preserve environmental integrity, um, avoid double counting um, of greenhouse gas emissions um, um, reductions uh, and provides a funding source to adaptation. And so the design of those rules becomes fundamental um, in the context of supporting and, and supplementing the ambition um, outcomes that we're seeing under the Paris Agreement rather than undermining um, that ambition goal um, uh, and, the, and the broader goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and so that becomes a really critical um, aspect of uh, further work that's continuing um, through this year and into next year. Stepping back politically um, following COP25, I mean, the COP, as people know, was a, um, was a difficult COP. It was a disappointing COP in terms of its outcome not just in terms of the unfinished business, but in terms of the political dynamic um, that was at play, um, in terms of the certain issues being held hostage to other issues, in terms of the broader um, tone of some of the discussions, things like transparency, which had been productive for a number of years um, in the negotiating room, ground to a halt um, at the COP last year. Um, and was effectively held hostage to other broader issues um, and not allowed to progress um, and now is faced with no work program really defined um, for the period between now um, and, uh, and the next COP. A very clear mandate still to deliver the finalisation of reporting templates and reporting outlines, review processes, um, but in terms of the mechanics of how that work is going to happen intersessionally, um, not that clear. So. Um, in, in that dynamic from COP25, we, we're in this, what I've called a delicate state of play, because we're um, faced with a situation um, where obviously, as we know, we've had some really challenging geopolitical developments um, in recent years. Um, we've had a challenging finance um, uh, landscape in terms of some of the major donors to the Green Climate Fund and others withdrawing support um, and therefore creating um, 
tensions in the, in the negotiating rooms um, consequently. Um, we've seen um, a lot of subnational and transnational alliances proliferate um, as a result of some of the um, inaction and problems in the negotiations themselves. Um, we've seen some really um, difficult discussions in the negotiations around how the science is actually received into the process um, and resistance from um, a number of notable countries uh, in terms of resisting having that accepted and, and referred to explicitly in decisions um, through the process. Um, we've had this disconnect between the advancing of technologies, um, the, the, the lowering of prices of renewables um, and, and whether that translates into national policies and, and therefore on the international stage um, in terms of engagement um, and this polarisation in public discourse um, through um, sort of competing movements on the one side, the youth led movement on the other side, this continuing um, challenge in terms of uh, certain global leaders uh, not separating their, their actions from the vested interests of fossil fuel and other interests. So that's, that's created a really um, difficult environment. And we've, we've seen as a result, um, very little action in, in the space of new and updated NDCs coming forward. Um, uh, technically, legally, they were um, supposed to come forward by the first quarter of, um, of this year, um, but certainly by the end of this year, if not by that time frame. Um, and we, we're still waiting for um, a significant number of NDCs to come forward, and particularly from, from major emitters to see that um, at the Climate Action Summit last year in September, convened by the Secretary General, um, very little um, in the way of concrete bringing forward of new NDCs. Um, a lot of announcements of intention to do that, um, but that was largely led by vulnerable countries and um, other countries from other groups, um, such as the ILAC group, um, and less so from major, major emitters. Um, and, and this goes to the ambition question um, and how we're going in terms of tracking um, on closing this ambition gap. Um, and this has really been missing in action in the, in the negotiations um, at the last COP and the COP before that, to be fair. Um, and, uh, but this year, it's really again being highlighted um, in terms of the, um, the intercessional activity that's going on about the, the continuing importance of seeing new and updated NDCs come forward um, this year in line with 1.5 degree pathways. Um, and the time frame still is this year, um, despite the fact the COP has been postponed to next year. Um, the decisions and the, and the text within those um, still refer to 2020. Um, and so that the mandate and, and the obligation is, is to do that. Um, and similarly with long-term um, development strategies um, uh, and, and the importance of these being in line with that 1.5 degree pathway um, to respond to the, the long-term temperature goal. Um, and the other important point scientifically is that he, achieving that goal, the 1.5 degrees, is still feasible. Difficult, but um, definitely still feasible in terms of what the IPC science, science is telling us um, and also telling us the, the very strong synergies and co-benefits with sustainable development and other things as part of that. So priorities for vulnerable countries in, in that context is the next part of this. Just to re-emphasise the agenda this year, um, there, as you can imagine, wanting to keep, as I've said there, and it was coming through in this in the recently convened Placencia Ambition Forum, um, which you can find details of on the AOSIS website, um, which was aimed at really in a sort of broader geopolitical sense um, and amongst some of the major negotiating groups, as well as within AOSIS, highlighting this importance of, of ambition. Um, and it's really because of this ex existential threat that exists where we see that um, the NDCs that are on the table at the moment are by no means um, putting us on a track towards a 1.5 degree pathway. And so that becomes really um, the driving priority around what LDCs and SIDS under the AOSIS group um, are pushing for through the course of this year. Higher ambition in NDCs, um, completion of this markets, Article 6 rules to provide robust rules environmental integrity, um, avoid double counting, um, delivering an overall mitigation and global emissions 
um, ensuring that the finance um, agenda continues to progress, having a clear process in place for uh, advancing the new um, collective finance goal to build on the $100 billion goal, um, um, annual $100 billion delivery by 2020 that's in place at the moment, um, and uh, an appropriate treatment of loss and damage, um, which as you can understand um, for particularly the vulnerable countries um, in terms of the um, action that can't be addressed or the, the impacts that aren't going to be able to be addressed through adaptation um, to have an appropriate international regime that delivers on loss and damage um, um, in terms of addressing the impacts um, and um, provides appropriate support and finance for, um, for loss and damage um, suffered. So it really is still a year of ambition um, this year and leading up to the COP next year. Um, and uh, that becomes a sort of a driving um, organizing and momentum principle through, through this year. So, so that's, that's the over, oversight in terms of the negotiation process, um, in terms of um, what's going on. Happy to take discuss, discussion and, and questions on specific aspects of that at the end, um, for sure. Um, the, the second half of, of today, I wanted to um, spend 15 or 20 minutes just talking through um, some, some more specifics in terms of things that are happening inside and outside the negotiations that could have a very strong impact on um, that ambition outcome that all countries have signed up to under Paris. Um, and the first of those is, um, given my audience today, um, is the Australian, what I've called the Australian factor. Um, and having witnessed this at, at the COP last year in Madrid, I thought it was important to bring forward some, some analysis and, and some um, thoughts uh, on that. Um, so as we entered into COP25 last um, December in Madrid, um, it, it came with a, um, a backdrop of uh, continuing sort of deterioration and, and lack of um, a change of direction in, in climate policy in, in Australia um, and, and an international landscape where Australia has been um, very muted or dismissing findings of, of the IPCC, um, withdrawing ongoing support uh, on the finance front to developing countries through the Green Climate Fund, um, continuing policy challenges and um, um, reluctance to progress policies around um, removing subsidising fossil fuel um, extraction um, in terms of uh, putting in place more complete and robust um, policies beyond the climate solutions package, emission reduction fund type setup. Um, and in that landscape, um, in terms of coming into the COP last year, um, we obviously also had the backdrop of, of the, the bushfire season. Um, and whilst that really you know, escalated to a new level, level in January, February, um, or particularly January, um, um, it was very much present in October, November, December, as we went into the COP. Um, and um, it was quite a stark contrast um, in terms of what that represented compared to some of the messaging that was coming through um, in the negotiations from from Australia. Um, and, and the messaging that was coming through from, from Minister Taylor and, and um, at the COP itself and from, from the Prime Minister, um, as people will be well aware that Australia's um, on track to meet and beat its, its NDC 2030 target, um, that it's playing its part, um, that it doesn't need to increase um, its 2030 target anymore, that that's set in place and, and that's going to remain the case um, despite the Paris call for more ambition um, every five years in updated NDCs um, and this old sort of catch cry of Australia's only 1.3%. So um, it's not about us, it's about everyone else. Um, so that, that was sort of the tone coming in and it was being repeated in the negotiations, um, despite the fact that it's quite clear from the government's own projections that um, emissions aren't yet decreasing um, and certainly not by any means on a trajectory towards a 1.5 degree limit. Um, and, and, and not representing Australia's um, fair share towards um, the collective efforts for that. Um, and, and also in the context of knowing when we look at the 
um, the facts on this that um, Australia's NDC target is on the weak side um, and even on the per capita emissions basis that the government likes to talk about um, in, in the context of other countries, including um, other large um, countries that I've shown there. Um, and um, and this, this is continuing through the context of the series of international agreements and engagement that's gone on for um, since the since 1990 um, and and so and continuing challenges um, through that. So the, the thing, the issue I wanted to focus on in particular to pick one is this issue of Kyoto Protocol carryover, um, because we had a very clear message coming through from Australia um, at the at the COP um, that in the context of its commitment to reduce um, emissions by below 2030. 2005 levels by 2030. Um, Australia wants to um, achieve, um, help achieve that through um, carryover of um, units from the from the Kyoto Protocol and, and from what it labels as its overachievement um, against its Kyoto Protocol targets. Um, and so, in the in the context of that, um, uh, that became a very recurring theme through the through the COP and it was in the context of that broader issue of Australia wanting to bring forward AAUs um, um, from its Kyoto period commitment periods um, for for use towards its NDC and also in the context of the broader discussion around the use of CERs um, from the clean development mechanism um, and other countries particularly Brazil um, highlighting their, their um, priority in, in being allowed to bring over um, at least a portion of those units um, through for use under the Article 6 um, regime. And so this, this created a very um, difficult environment in the context of um, the Article 6 and the broader negotiations um, in, in, uh, in Madrid. Uh, and um, it, it might seem like sort of an Australian issue around wanting to do that, but it was very clear that, that the Australia position on this had a had a very significant impact on the the, the tone and the and the dynamic of the negotiations um, because by having a, a developed um, middle sized country um, uh, coming forward with such a strong position and it was the only country pushing the line on on bringing forward AAUs for um, contributing towards its NDC um, that really um, caused um, a range of Problems in the in the negotiations and the ability to make progress on 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 those and related issues. Um, so that's important to recognise because it wasn't um, it's not just a sideline issue. It actually goes to the fundamentals of progressing these aspects of the negotiations. So um, climate analytics and um, and uh, um, a consultant MJ Mace that we work closely with um, uh, as an expert on on these issues. Um, prepared this report um, in the lead up to and, and, and released it in Madrid last year that just had a closer look um, at, at this issue of overachievement um, and the legal basis for carryover. Um, and so I wanted to bring that to people's attentions if, attention if people haven't seen it um, um, and recommend it for a read <laughs> at, the end of, at the end of this. Um, and what it does is, is just look analytically at, at the, the claims that Australia was making um, in the context of overachievement um, in the first instance. And what, that, what the report illustrates is that, um, is that the um, reliance or, the, or the, the portrayal of overachievement is actually really a, a sort of technical manufacturing of a position based on anomalies from the Kyoto accounting rules um, and from the sort of legacy issue of the fact that Australia was able to rely um, on um, on the deforestation um, position back in 1990 and the legacy benefits that flowed through from um, um, high emission levels and baseline positions um, back at that period, right through um, the Kyoto period and relying on that um, and the low targets that they had under, um, under Kyoto, including a 108% target in the first commitment period. Um, to use, use that to um, effectively rely on historical um, 
emission reductions to bring forward those through um, and to bring that forward into the Paris Agreement. The second part of the report, um, what it does is, is to explain that on a legal basis, um, there's really no legal basis for that carryover um, to bring forward pre-2021 units into the Paris Agreement regime. Um, first and foremost, um, they're different um, treaties under international law. Um, and secondly, even under um, the Kyoto Protocol um, framework itself, um, that as, as a protocol doesn't permit the carryover of units um, or its underlying reductions um, beyond um, the second commitment period, which as we know, hasn't um, yet come into force anyway. Um, and so there can't be a carryover of either AUs or CERs to a non-existent sort of subsequent period um, or, or a third commitment period. Um, and, and finally, on the legal side, there's no, um, to allow that would require a, a very explicit um, decision through the UNFCCC process um, and the Paris Agreement process, the CMA, which is the body responsible for um, the Paris Agreement under the um, UNFCCC regime, um, to express, expressly permit that carryover to come across. Um, so, um, so that's really important to recognise in the context of the ongoing negotiations on this. Um, thirdly, from an equity point of view, um, the Paris Agreement is very clear in terms of highest possible ambition, promoting environmental integrity, ensuring avoidance of double counting. Um, to, to allow this um, on those, those principles would be, um, it wouldn't be adhering to those, it would be undermining um, the effective ambition um, of NDCs in the Paris Agreement more, more generally. The other thing that it would do is, um, if it was to, Australia was to do it, um, it would in effect reduce um, Australia's actual target of actual emissions that they have to do now, rather than relying on these historical um, um, positions. Um, and their 26% target on the analysis in this report suggests it would, it would only become, it would become only a 14.3% reduction below 25, 2005 levels. Um, so stepping back on the international stage, that, that's very significant in terms of, in effect, reducing Australia's commitment to emission reductions in the context of an NDC, which um, um, is broadly recognised um, and has been assessed under um, um, through things like the Climate Action Tracker as being insufficient as a 2030 30 target. Um, and, and this report isn't the only piece that's done this. There was also um, uh, a letter that was provided by nine um, academics, nine professors um, to the government um, earlier this year, a couple of months ago through um, outlining um, a similar view that the, the legal, um, there's no legal basis um, for allowing this carryover of units across um, into, um, into the Paris Agreement regime. And so that's, that's going to be um, a continuing issue and the continuing subjects of diplomatic efforts as well as technical work um, over the coming months in the lead up to, um, to COP26. It also has, a, as I said earlier, a much broader implication in terms of the overall architecture of the Article 6 rules um, in terms of what it means in relation to this trajectory towards 1.5. Um, because if it's allowed in the context of AUs, in the context of CERs under Article 6, um, it could really undermine um, the ambition that we've um, got on the table from NDCs at the moment. Um, some an analysis that uh, Climate Analytics did back in, in Madrid also suggesting that, that could amount to uh, a reduction in ambition of some 38%. Um, and, and that in the context um, of a need for a 1.5 trajectory um, to have an increase in ambition in the next round of NDCs um, to increase increase by 50%. So you can see there, you know, if we if we're going down this path, the challenge, as you can see on the graph there, of delayed, uh, effectively delaying action through the NDC um, existing and updating process, um, really makes the challenge of that 1.5 degree pathway all the more difficult um, in the short, short and long term. Um, and so the issue um, did obviously come through in, in Madrid squarely. Um, as people know, there was no agreement on the Article 6 rules um, 
possible in Madrid, and that's gone forward to the next um, the next COP um, with a mandate to try to complete that by then. Um, one of the outcomes was um, what people might have heard of uh, the San Jose principles, which was a, a set of principles not in the process formally itself, not in negotiating text, but um, some principles that were brought forward by um, 32 governments, I think, in the end, um, with a set of uh, ambition and integrity principles for guiding the work on the finalisation of the Article 6 rules. And that included this uh, principle of prohibiting the use of pre-2020 units. Um, so that's, um, that's important um, in the context of the foundation for further work. So I want to spend the last few minutes, um, next, next five minutes or so, just also bringing your attention to some work that um, the Climate Analytics has been doing with the New Climate Institute as part of the um, Climate Action Tracker uh, in the context of the COVID-19 um, implications and, and our climate response alongside that. Um, and obviously every, every presentation on climate these days needs to have a importantly to have a have a COVID element to it because the two two issues clearly go squarely hand in hand in terms of um the action that we're taking um i've called it an existential fork in the road i mean existential for um certainly for sids and ldscs in terms of what happens over the coming months in relation to um the recovery but obviously equally critical for all all countries in the context of um how we're tracking in terms of that 1.5 degree goal um and whether the COVID-19 recovery um, is contributing, supporting um, the climate action efforts or undermining um, those efforts. Um, so that becomes a critical juncture um, in, uh, in the coming weeks and, and months. Um, and it's really important also because on the ground, we we're seeing that uh, global progress stalling on a number of fronts um, over the last couple of years. Um, in the context of emission levels, in the context of continuing um, increase in fossil fuel um, emissions, uh, in the context of some stalling around um, renewables, despite price um, still dropping and, and becoming much more competitive than on the fossil side. Um, and in the context of knowing from the science that uh, we need these economy transformations to be on track towards 1.5 um, across across all sectors um, in terms of decarbonisation. And obviously, I know lots of people on the, on the call heavily involved in, in all that work um, and well familiar with the fact that phase out of coal needs to um, be a fundamental um, part of achieving, um, achieving 1.5 um, with a very steep um, decline um, in uh, electricity generation from coal over the coming period, um, as you can see from, from the figures there. Um, and also a very limited future for gas in a 1.5 degree world. Um, you might think otherwise hearing some of the comments from the government in recent, um, recent days, um, but uh, clearly again, the science um, from the IPCC is showing, um, and some you know, acknowledging some differing in numbers across different reports here, as you can see on the, on the slide, um, but um, a fairly clear picture that uh, or a very clear picture that uh, the drop off of gas needs to happen as part of this transition um, away from fossil fuels and towards um, renewables. Um, and that's not going to be um, a significant part of the, of the energy mix um, in the long term. Um, and so that phase down needs to happen um, rapidly. Um, and obviously also the, with that comes the investment side. Um, and as um, we know under the Paris Agreement, there's a specific goal in terms of Article 21C that talks to the need for um, the, the financial flows moving from the brown to the green side um, and that major shift of investments um, as well as financial support and other things to developing countries to help along, the ro along that road. Um, and uh, so that, that all needs to happen. We know that needs to happen. We knew that before the COVID um, crisis, and we knew that um, the falling cost of renewables creates these major opportunities. Um, and so the Climate Action Tracker did some analysis to say, well, let's, let's do some work on scenarios around the recovery um, and look at um, what different scenarios produce in the context of 
um, different post-COVID responses. Um, and this was done for the purposes of supporting some of the um, messaging and dialogue at the recent Petersburg Climate Dialogue um, um, earlier this month. Um, and there's some further work in the pipeline in terms of um, some more granular, granular anal analysis around um, country level um, positions um, and planning for, for upcoming sessions. And so what this, what this analysis did is look at um, different scenarios around um, if there was a rebounding in fossil fuels um, through policy responses to COVID-19 versus um, different levels of green, green stimulus, green recovery from a, a sort of weak signal through to a very strong signal. Um, and what it found was uh, there's some very clear do's and don'ts that uh, um, come through in the context of the COVID-19 recovery um, in the context of um, all, the, all the main sectors. Um, so in relation to energy and electricity, for example, um, having direct support for zero emission technology and infrastructure, fiscal reform on fossil fuel subsidies, um, as opposed to reviving plans for shovel-ready fossil fuel power plants, to take one example. Um, on the, on the land-based transport, um, having the right financial incentives, um, direct in investment into, into public transport, low-carbon public transport, um, not having rollback of emission standards for cars, um, on buildings, for example, supporting energy-efficient retrofits, um, um, not having stimulus that is aimed towards new buildings without having energy efficiency criteria. So absent those sort of criteria, it would be going in the wrong direction. Um, and so um, I'm not going to go into all the, all the detail of the report, but encourage, encourage you to look on the, on the Climate Action Tracker website for, for the full analysis and, and the full outline of that. And obviously that goes hand in hand with a whole range of really good research and, and publications that are coming through on, on this issue. Um, but bringing it back to the negotiations, it becomes very important in the context of um, the political dynamic around, um, around these voices for a green recovery. And we're seeing it at the international level um, through a range of international organisations, um, as well as um, at national and regional um, levels, um, in the EU and others. Um, but um, again, going back to the Australian context, we're seeing certainly some strong messaging coming through from business groups um, and um, organisations that we'd expect to, to be championing the green recovery. But we're also seeing some um, early disturbing um, sounds coming from the Australian government in terms of a gas-fired recovery, um, contrasting to, to the graph I had before. Um, and some legislative um, manoeuvring going on, um, which uh, seem to point towards more of a continuation of um, reliance on fossil fuel um, as a as a go to um, energy source rather than rather than renewables. Um, you know, obviously, it's early days, but uh, I think the opportunity in the Australian context, um, coupled with engagement in the international context, is to make sure that um, these next few months. Um, create the right, not just the right narrative, but the right series of policy responses and action um, in that context. Um, and so that's going to become a really important um, uh, dialogue that's going to happen. Uh, I don't need to tell my audience today, for everyone there in Australia, the importance of that over coming months um, and also the importance of that in the context of the, um, the international climate diplomacy and, and engagement that's going to happen. And, and that becomes, there's a lot of text here, but this is just, um, you can take this away to, to read, but I think captures quite nicely the, the opportunity and the, the transformative nature of what has to happen over the, over the coming period um, from the chair of AOSIS at the recent Placencia Forum. Um, and, and that becomes really important in the context, as I say, of this period between now and the COP in terms of the di diplomatic outreach that's going to happen around um, and engagement on more ambition in terms of how that aligns with these green recovery efforts, um, in terms of how that translates into new and updated NDCs and the continuing pressure and expectation that those NDCs come forward, not just from SIDS or LDCs, but from major emitters, um, most critically, um, as well as the long-term strategies um, 
for this year as well. Um, and so that's, that becomes um, the critical agenda um, for this um, slightly prolonged period um, in the lead up to, uh, to COP2026. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, thanks for um, listening to, to what was quite a lot of information, but um, hopefully um, some overview um, perspectives as well as some more technical work that um, I, as I say, encourage people to go and look at some of those reports um, and to, to study those and engage in those further um, in the context of um, all the work that you're involved in um, and the further work that we're collectively going to be engaging on um, over the coming months. And so with that, I'll um, um, pass back for um, any questions and, and discussions. And thanks again very much for the opportunity and um, uh, all the best, thanks. Thank you very much, Damon. And if we we're actually live in person, I'm sure there'd be a, a very warm round of applause at this point. I acknowledge it's probably a little bit odd sitting there in what is almost silence having just finished um, 50 minutes of talking. Um, so at this point, I think we'll, we'll turn to questions as we said, and I think let's aim to get two or three in before 5 p.m. But as I said previously, Damon's very kindly offered to stick around for a bit longer than that. So if people wanna continue after the formal proceedings are over, then you are most welcome to. Uh, in that vein, I was gonna to go to um, Raul Salas Reyes to ask the first question. And Raul, I will just unmute you now. And then you're, you've got the floor and are free to talk. Um, now, with any luck. Do you want me to stop sharing the screen or is that fine to leave it as it is? No, no, please leave it as it is. That's great. Okay. Um, all right, are you having a few technical diffuse with Raul? Aha. Okay, I'll ask, I'll read your question out loud for you then instead. Um, so Raul's okay. question was, why do you think that Article 6 negotiations have become somewhat toxic? That was, sorry, have become somewhat toxic. Okay, um, well, they've, they've been, I mean, the, the Article 6 space has been, has been toxic or at least problematic for quite a number of years um, before Paris as well um, under, the, under the convention regime. Um, and I, I guess we're seeing a, a continuation of that, uh, of that through, through the Article 6 negotiations. Um, we're seeing toxicity, I think, because there are some very strongly held positions from a number of countries. So I've explained the Australia situation um, to take another country, Brazil, um, very strongly held positions uh, in terms of um, the CER um, carryover issue um, and wanting to ensure that that's part of what it's able to do. And, and motivated in part, at least by, um, well, significant part by the fact that um, uh, Brazil is holding a lot of CERs um, and wants to be able to use them um, in the market. I mean, more fundamentally, um, it, it's toxic because there are some very diverging views on what um, the broader Article 6 um, regime should look like um, and whether it should have certain features that you can read in the Paris Agreement, but there are diverging views on whether they're, um, how you actually operationalise those um, on issues such as um, corresponding adjustments um, which translates through to the double counting issue um, on how you operationalise environmental integrity um, in terms of the, the funding issue, in terms of share of proceeds, which is a critical issue for developing countries. So you've got these country positions that become come to loggerheads um, in the negotiations and a very strong reluctance for countries to back down. So that's created some uh, ongoing um, challenges and will continue to over the coming months. Great, thank you very much. Alrighty, um, let's try now with Danny Robertson, who's from Climate Works. Danny, you should be able to unmute yourself and talk now. Uh, yep, I think I can. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah, hi, Danny. Great, uh, Damon. Thanks for the uh, really interesting discussion. My question was around long-term strategies. The 2050 Pathways Platform predicts that uh, 40 countries were due to submit their long-term strategies this year in 2020, as per the Paris Agreement. Uh, if this proceeds, do you think the combined submissions of these long-term strategies will address that, that ambition gap that you talked about? Or do you fear that some of those strategies will lack ambition 
um, for example, like China's recent submission. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we're. I think we're some significant way from being in a situation where we could have confidence that what's coming forward in terms of number of strategies and content um, is yet doing enough to um, be closing that ambition gap. Um, I think the way things are looking, um, unless we have a sort of more fundamental um, progression of, of those strategies coming forward, we, we, we can hopefully see some trajectories that um, close the gap to some extent, but it's not going to be, um, um, it's, it's not yet at a point where we were on that pathway um, as, uh, as we haven't seen enough of the strategies yet um, in, from, from major emitters and, um, and some of the content, as, you say, as you're suggesting, um, aren't um, giving a huge amount of confidence on that front. So um, no, I think um, whilst there's certainly some good momentum, um, where we've got some some way to go. Great, thank you for that question, Danny. I think we'll turn for the last part of the formal proceedings uh, to Roger Dargaville to ask the final question. Roger, you should be ready to go now. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Zebedee, and thanks, Damon, for your presentation. Um, as as uh, obviously you're aware, the NDC is a voluntary, and one of the reasons why the Paris Agreement was struck was because it wasn't trying to make things compulsory in the way that the Kyoto Protocol did. So given that the NDCs are voluntary, what kind of pressure or penalties can be applied to countries like Australia um, to try and encourage stronger commitment to the, the Paris Agreement? For example, the um, EU has proposed a, a cross-border carbon price for goods coming into the EU from countries that don't apply an appropriate carbon price within their own country. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Roger, for the question. I mean, firstly, I think it's important to be careful how we um, talk about NDCs as, as being voluntary. I think it's important to make the distinction between there's a clear obligation, and it's not voluntary, an obligation under parties to the Paris Agreement to bring forward, um, and you find this in Article 4, um, bring forward NDCs um, to communicate those every five years. So the, the physical act of communicating an NDC is mandatory. It's an obligation. The voluntary part is, um, is the um, discretion that countries have on a nationally determined basis, as NDCs, the term would suggest, um, to bring forward a target that they see uh, as being appropriate for their um, circumstances um, and, and to, as they see as being representing their highest possible ambition. Um, and so, and in that context, it's different to Kyoto in the sense that in Kyoto, there were negotiated targets, top-down NDCs, obligation to bring forward an NDC, um, but bottom-up in terms of nationally determined nature of what target each country brings in its NDC. So that's a really important distinction because it, it, it doesn't mean that it's a voluntary exercise. It means um, there's um, flexibility in terms of what is contained in those NDCs that are obliged to be brought forward. Um, in terms of penalties, um, the um, well, there's two parts of that, I think, um, that I read into your, into your question. Firstly, I mean, there's, a, there's the regime itself in terms of compliance regime, in terms of transparency system, which um, is designed in a way that creates pressure through collective action um, and expectation um, that if countries aren't bringing forward an NDC, everyone else is, then the spotlight is shining and then why aren't you contributing when we are? Um, and that's evident through the requirement to report on progress and achievement of implementation of NDCs um, and also the implementation um, aspects and, and facilitative processes under the compliance committee that's established under the, under the Paris Agreement, um, which granted is very facilitative and fairly soft in nature. It's not going to whack a penalty on a country um, in a punitive sense, um, and it's not designed to. So that's one side. And then I guess your your reference to um, border taxes and so on is, is what happens outside the process in terms of how countries either unilaterally or, or bilaterally or, or more collectively on a multilateral basis decide to respond to how different countries are, um, are choosing to implement their obligations under the Paris Agreement and what they're bringing forward in their NDCs. I mean, that comes down to that broader um, broader issue of, of um, 
policy responses through through the, the climate space itself, as well as trade and other things that you're um, alluding to in your in your question. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, everyone, for your participation in today's webinar. I think we've had a great webinar, and that's largely due to Damon, but also to everyone there in the audience. Um, so, as we said, I'll just bring things to a close, and then I'll um, stop the recording. But the webinar will continue for those of you who wish to keep discussing. I just want to, at this point, mention a couple of upcoming seminars from the Climate and Energy College. So we've got two. So the first is uh, tomorrow, where we have Stephen Pollard's PhD completion seminar, and his topic is Locating Net Zero Emissions, an Ethnographic Comparison of Local Approaches to Community Scale Carbon Neutrality. And then the second one is uh, next Wednesday at 11 a.m. That's by Alex Lehman from Flow Power and Maria Petkovic from Energy Synapse. And their title is Industrial Demand Response, Implementation, Types, and Contractual Considerations. And if you're interested in either of those, I'd invite you to re register on the Climate and Energy College's website, which should be, with any luck, on your screens right now. And there we go. Let's try that again. So there's the two seminars, and the link at the bottom will give you the, the, uh, the link to, registers, to register and look at upcoming events. And with all of that, I'll thank Damon once more. I hope he enjoys imagining the claps in his head. And thanks everyone in the audience. Uh, and we'll stop the recording and leave this uh, Zoom meeting going for anyone who'd like to keep discussing from here on. Thanks very much. Thank you all.